window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! This is the Tearing Down Idols podcast, where we strike at the root of America's problems. Hey, hello everyone. Welcome back. This is episode 9 of the Tearing Down Idols podcast. We're going to do things a little bit differently this time around. I'm kind of winging it on this episode. Usually I have a whole bunch of notes telling me where to go, reminding me where to go, helping me when my brain hits a roadblock or whatever. But this time I am freewheeling it. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, Just a quick update, I have some projects coming up, as I mentioned in previous episodes, one of which is, and I'm revealing it now, an online conference. Myself and a couple of others are planning to do a conference online that people can attend in their own homes. We're going to have some messages that people can listen to live. You can tune in by either internet or by phone. If you don't have that option, it's going to be both video and audio. And then uh, at the end of all of that, we're going to have maybe three messages from individual people. And then at the end of it, we'll have a chat. We're going to open up the chat and people will be able to comment or ask questions or what have you. And the three speakers will field them at about the same time. So it should be really fun interaction, especially these days with gas prices being what they are and everything this is an opportunity for people to sort of kind of get the same experience as a conference without having to travel anywhere and spend that money so it's no charge just uh keep an eye open for the link i'll announce it and i'll put the link in the description of the video and also i'll put it on my website tearingdownidols.com so people will be able to click on that if they want to join by internet Or if they want to join by phone, they'll simply call in by the number that I'll provide, punch in the pin, and they'll be able to listen that way. So keep your ear to the ground for that. We're very excited about it. We're just working out some of the kinks at this point, making sure everybody's able to do this thing, technologically speaking. But yeah, we're all pumped. Really excited about this. So anyway, today... I had an idea for one thing I was going to do for this episode, but I scrapped it, kind of a last minute thing, because I wanted to address something that's much more pertinent to the immediate events that are taking place in this day. As you've all no doubt noticed, it's getting harder and harder to live right now. The economy is going down the toilet, we've got shortages galore, you name it, it's happening. Things are going nuts here in the Western world. So what I thought I would do is try to put it somewhat in perspective so people can see what's going on in light of scripture and history. I want to give you people some hope like I did in the last episode. What we're watching right now is kind of scary. All right, I'm right on board with all of you and saying, man, what what's it going to look like next week, next month, next year? That's a huge question mark. Nobody really knows. And so, when we're looking at all these things going down, we as mortal humans who are not omniscient are stuck trying to guess what's happening. And a lot of us, we fall prey to this fear thing. It's hard to remind ourselves sometimes that God is in control, that he is indeed sovereign. And none of this is happening outside of not only his knowledge, but also outside of his doing in his control his hand is in all of this and also none of this is happening without his foreknowledge so i just want to bring that up to you all now what i'd like to do is first take you on a little history trip and history is 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 an interesting thing because it's been said before and it's very true history is prophecy fulfilled prophecy is history foretold and also and it might have been added biblically sometimes history is the future foretold the reason being i think we being fallible human beings we keep making the same mistakes and god who does not change keeps responding in the same way 
God's enemy has been the same since the beginning. God's people have been the same since the beginning. And the traits and the characteristics and tendencies of those characters will always be the same. I hope that makes sense. So anyway, what I want to do is take you back in time to Babylon, ancient Babylon. Now, as you recall, no doubt, Babylon was the city that took the house of Judah captive. They carried away the king and his people off to Babylon, and there they remained captive for 70 years. And among those captives was the prophet Daniel. As time went on, they saw the rise and fall of various kingdoms, the rise of Medo-Persia off to the north and east of Babylon, and the decline of Babylon. Now, what a lot of people don't realize when they're reading Daniel is we're, we're, we're kind of looking at a cliff's notes of Daniel's life. These things didn't happen day one, day two, day three. When he, By the time he was speaking to Belshazzar, you remember the story of the hand appearing on the wall, Daniel was an old man. Now, I'm not going to read through the entire chapter of Daniel 5, but what I would like to mention here is just some of the highlights of this. As you know, and you can break out your Bible, look at Daniel 5 with me. Belshazzar is described here in the Bible as Nebuchadnezzar's son, or that it's said that Nebuchadnezzar is Belshazzar's father. Now, this is not an inaccuracy to say that Belshazzar was actually Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, because father was a fairly broad term for simply one's ancestors at that time. Belshazzar was actually Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, as we would more specifically see it today. Nebuchadnezzar had died. Belshazzar was reigning. Now, by the time Daniel 5 rolls around, one of the things that we are not told in the scriptural text is while these things are taking place, while Belshazzar is having this feast and Daniel is speaking to Belshazzar, outside of the walls of Babylon is the army of Cyrus the Persian. And we read about this in Herodotus's history, very classic ancient history. And I'm going to read a little bit from Herodotus. We'll go back to the Bible, and hopefully it'll give you a more rounded feel for the story. So Herodotus tells us that when Cyrus and his troops arrived at Babylon, this is what happened. It says, The Babylonians had taken the field and were awaiting his, Cyrus's, approach. When he arrived near the city, they attacked him, but were defeated and forced to retire inside their defenses. They already knew of Cyrus's restless ambition and had watched his successive acts of aggression against one nation after another. And as they had taken the precaution of accumulating in Babylon a stock of provisions sufficient to last many years, they were able to regard the prospect of a siege with indifference. The siege dragged on, no progress was made, and Cyrus was beginning to despair of success. Then somebody suggested, or he himself thought up, the following plan. And then it goes into the plan. We'll get into that later. But at this point, as we read later on in this same account by Herodotus, and we'll get to that, in order basically to raise morale in Babylon, because they were so confident that Babylon would not be taken, Belshazzar decided to hold a feast. Now, this feast is the very one that we read about in Daniel 5. And it says in chapter 5 of Daniel, verse 1, Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar his father, or grandfather, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now, this is 
a very awful thing that Belshazzar is doing because what he has done is not only in the midst of his siege decided to throw a party, but he's decided to desecrate the holy vessels which were meant to be used in the holy services by the Levites in the temple of God. This is spitting in God's face. This was an awful thing to do when he was in the middle of a siege. He's asking for divine retribution at this point. And then we read about the hand appearing on the wall and writing the words and nobody could understand it. Belshazzar is upset. And finally, Daniel is brought in. Daniel, the prophet, comes in and he interprets it. And this is what he says. He says, now this is the inscription that was written out. Mene, mene, tekel, upharsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. So this is the interpretation that Daniel gives to Belshazzar. I do find it rather ironic, and I'm sure Daniel was shaking his head, that as soon as he gives this, this interpretation to Belshazzar, Belshazzar goes ahead and makes him third ruler in the kingdom. And then Belshazzar is slain that night. And Darius and Cyrus take over Babylon. Darius becomes king in Babylon at that time. Cyrus was the one who was working alongside Darius the Mede to take Babylon. Okay, so what happened that night? What happened that night to facilitate the Medes and the Persians' entrance into Babylon. This was very sudden. One minute, Belshazzar and his nobles are drinking and partying it up. The next, Belshazzar is dead, and Babylon is being ruled over by Darius the Mede. Well, Herodotus explains this, and so does Xenophon in another of his accounts. But I'm going to stick with stick with Herodotus. Now, it's important to keep in mind what kind of a city Babylon was. Babylon had a massive wall that went around the entire city. And this wall was so thick that several chariots could ride abreast of each other along the top of the wall. The entire wall built of brick was that thick, almost impregnable, which is why Belshazzar and his nobles were so confident that they were safe in celebrating in the face of the siege. Also, the gates leading into this city leading into Babylon through the walls. It wasn't just one gate leading in. These gates were like tunnels through the walls where you had to go through multiple gates in order to get in. And no doubt there were arrow loops above where you could be shot at or or rocks could be thrown on to you or boiling oil. That part is conjecture because obviously we don't have the walls today to look at. But no doubt that's what they did because that was how they defended their cities at that time. Either way, you couldn't just get through those gates. You couldn't just bust through that wall. And this is why Cyrus was despairing. Cyrus, who'd had no problem taking other cities out, Babylon was a real brain bender for him. Now, in order to understand how Cyrus did it, and we'll read this from Herodotus, but I'm trying to lay the groundwork here. The layout of Babylon was rather unique. Not only did they have their hanging gardens, which were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, but also the river Euphrates ran through the city of Babylon. It ran in from the north and out through the south, under the walls. Trade ran through the Euphrates, and this is important to keep in mind. The Euphrates was essential for Babylon's survival, economically and agriculturally. From the Euphrates, they had dug irrigation canals all around so they could water their crops. But also the Euphrates was where traders came down. They would come down from the north in boats made of wood and skins. They would come down to Babylon on the Euphrates. Once they arrived at Babylon, they would break down their boats, load them onto mules, and take the mules back north. The Euphrates was the lifeblood of Babylon as far as trade and agriculture were concerned. Without the Euphrates, there would have been no Babylon. There would have been no civilization there, no agriculture, no trade, nothing. So the Euphrates was a very important river, so important that they had it running straight through the city. Now within the walls of the city, 
It was sort of like the streets of Vienna. The streets went down to the river and steps went down the banks to the river. But where there weren't steps, they had walls. They built walls all along the banks of the Euphrates River. And where the steps came down, they had guarded gates. So even if you did manage to get past the walls, you'd be like fish in a barrel going down the Euphrates, going through Babylon. Babylon was a very, very, very well-defended city. Now here was what Cyrus came up with. And this is what Herodotus has to say. Then somebody suggested, or he himself, thought up the following plan. He stationed part of his force at the point where the Euphrates flows into the city, and another contingent at the opposite end where it flows out, with orders to both to force an entrance along the riverbed as soon as they saw that the river was shallow enough. Then, taking with him all his non-combatant troops, he withdrew to the spot where Netochris, Netochris was the queen of Babylon who had the hanging gardens built and had also dug out a lake near Babylon, had excavated the lake and proceeded to repeat the operation which the queen had previously performed. By means of a cutting, he diverted the river into the lake, which was then a marsh, and in this way so greatly reduced the depth of water in the actual bed of the river that it became fordable. And the Persian army, which had been left at Babylon for the purpose, entered the river, now only deep enough to reach about the middle of a man's thigh, and making their way along it, got into the town. If the Babylonians had learnt what Cyrus was doing, or had seen it for themselves in time, they could have let the Persians enter, and then, by shutting all the gates which led to the waterside, and manning the walls on either side of the river, they could have caught them in a trap and wiped them out. But as it was, they were taken by surprise. The Babylonians themselves say that, owing to the great size of the city, the outskirts were captured without the people in the center knowing anything about it. There was a festival going on, and they continued to dance and enjoy themselves until they learned the news the hard way. That, then, is the story of the first capture of Babylon. So that's Herodotus and what he has to say about the capture of Babylon. And the second witness is, of course, Xenophon, who was also a Greek historian, giving the account of the fall of Babylon and others of his histories. The point is that we see here that Cyrus diverted the waters of the Euphrates so that it dried up and made or prepared the way for the kings Cyrus and Darius, who came from the east, the north and the east. That's where the Medo-Persian Empire was in relation to Babylon at that time. It opened up the way for the kings to take Babylon. Now, where do we read about something similar to that? Well, let's jump ahead a little bit to Revelation. If we go to the book of Revelation, chapter 16, if you're a preterist or a futurist, you may not like what I have to say here, but tough. Chapter 16, we read in verse 12 that the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Now, isn't that interesting? It's almost as if He's describing what we read about in Herodotus, does it not? But, obviously, it isn't, because these events were supposed to take place after John wrote them, and John wrote them after Christ. The date I will not discuss here. That's a topic for another time. But, it says that the way was open for the kings from the east. We, we read about the dragon and the beast, and the false prophet, and the three unclean spirits like frogs coming out to gather the kings of the whole world together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty, and they gather them to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Armageddon, the Valley of Megiddo. Now remember, Revelation is a book of symbols. It is not meant to be taken literally. A lot of what we read in Revelation is intended to be taken as a, as a symbolic representation of what God wants us to get out of it. So those who have studied prophetic language 
can better understand what God is trying to tell us in the book of Revelation. Now, the Valley of Megiddo, or the city of Megiddo, Armageddon, it was located in what was known as the Valley of Jezreel in Palestine, near Mount Gilboa. And that is a location where multiple times the might of the proud or the might of kings was broken. For example, we read about Sisera and Judges being defeated and um, then finally being killed by Jael with the spike through his head. We read about the Midianites being defeated there by Gideon in Judges. We read about the death of Saul at the Valley of Megiddo or near Mount Gilboa. We read about Josiah being defeated there after he had rebelled against God. And we also read in Hosea chapter 1 verses 4 through 5 about God breaking the bow of rebellious Israel in the Valley of Jezreel, which would be an equivalent to the Valley of Megiddo or Armageddon. So repeatedly we see the destruction of the proud and the wicked in the Valley of Jezreel or the Valley of Megiddo, or the hill or city of Megiddo, depending on how you want to interpret the word Armageddon. But that's the point of the word Armageddon being used in Revelation. The kings of the earth are gathered together in order that they might be broken or destroyed, brought down, slain at Armageddon. All right, moving on to the seventh bowl of wrath. Now, historically... We are understood to be in the time of the seventh bowl of wrath, which began about the time of World War I. And we can go into all the details of that at some other time. I'm not in a position at the moment to debate it. I don't have the time to explain it at this point. I would like to point you to Carl Tester's uh, YouTube channel, which I have listed at the bottom of my YouTube page. So go ahead and check that out. He's got some great stuff on there. It says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And then there were flashes of lightning, sounds, and peals of thunder. There was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts, the great city being Babylon, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and so on and so forth. Now, then chapter 17 and 18 go into how Babylon is destroyed, and we notice that Babylon is destroyed economically. It is a great, powerful economic force, just like Babylon of old was in its day. We read about how the kings of the earth and the merchants and all the rest are mourning because she was such a great economic power. How was this to be done? Well, I'm inclined to think that what we're seeing today with our economy going down the toilet in a way that has never happened in the history of the world, even the Great Depression does not hold a candle to what we are facing at this time. I would posit that the Euphrates drying up, which happened during the time of the sixth seal prior to World War I, was the commencement of the drying up of our economic power in the West. 1913, the Federal Reserve was instituted, which then took over the entirety of the economy in the United States and, of course, was linked to the Bank of England in London. And as the saying goes, if America sneezes, the rest of the world catches pneumonia. The economic center of the world is America at this time. 80% of the world's commerce goes to the United States. We are the world's largest consumer, as is illustrated by Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. I'm not saying that America itself is Babylon. What I'm saying is the power that rules over America and the rest of the Western world is Babylonian to its core. Our economic system, our insurances, our various taxation systems, our philosophies, our religions, all of this is Babylonian. We are a Babylonian culture. And the Euphrates, which is the great economic current, hence the word currency, it begins to dry up. It began to dry up toward the end of the period of the sixth seal. The, the water 
begins to dry up and it prepares the way for the kings from the east. And then we go on to read about the kings being gathered together to battle. Does this not sound an awful lot like what happened to Babylon when Cyrus took it over? I would say it does. We're running out of time here, but what I'd like to mention is that this is what leads to the fall of Babylon, the drying up of the economic Euphrates that currently feeds Babylon, the Babylon that rules over the West, i.e. the Israelite, Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Celtic, Scandinavian peoples of Israel. Now, just a final tidbit here. I want you to notice that the seventh seal is said to have begun in 1917, which is very interesting because that was about the time of World War I. But what's more is that when Babylon took Jerusalem, attacked Jerusalem and hauled them off captive, they signed their death warrant with God. Even though they were the instrument of God and his judgment against Israel, they signed their death warrant. If we look at Jeremiah 25, real quickly, turn with me if you've got your Bible, Jeremiah 25, he's speaking of Babylon and God's judgment on it. And he explains, and there are several different places where we can read about God's judgment on Babylon, um, and also in Isaiah, particularly in 13 and 14. But Jeremiah 25, in verse 12, he says, Then it will be when 70 years are completed, and that's the 70 years of the Israelite captivity, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares Yahweh, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. So if we understand that Babylon had basically signed its death warrant when it hauled Israel off into captivity, then we can count forward from there. When Babylon took Judah captive, which was five 38 BC, then we can understand the meaning of many, many Tekel Eupharsin if we go back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 5. So let's go to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel interprets the handwriting on the wall. Mene, Mene, Tekel Eupharsin or Perez. Mene, Mene. Mene has a numerical value of 1,000. So we have mene, mene, that's 2,000. Tekel has a numerical value of 500, and Eupharsin, or Perez, is, has a numerical value of 20. So 2,520. 2,520 years from the capture of Judah and its captivity in Babylon brings us to 1917. After Babylon fell, it was no longer any kind of a force in the world until what happened in 1917. Well, two big things happened in 1917. One, we had the Balfour Declaration, which opened the door for the so-called and self-styled Jews to enter Palestine and take it over and establish the Zionist state, which has since become the hub of political activity and debate and theft and lies and overall wickedness in the world today. But also in 1917, and this is probably, debatably, an even bigger event, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, which was not a Russian revolution, but a self-admitted Jewish revolution and established communism as a world power. Communism, of course, being the political manifestation of Judaism or Talmudism. Babylon, the Babylonian Talmud. Babylon became the world power again in 1917 and the rise of communism and it gradually began taking over the world. This was the end of of Babylon's seven times. If you count seven times, a biblical year being 360 days, you end up with 2,520. That's seven times, each day being a year in, in prophetic language, you have 2,520 years, and you end up at 1917. Isn't that interesting? It is at that point that the Euphrates began to dry up. 
It's at that moment that the Euphrates, the economic current of the world, began to diminish. Folks, this is not a reason for Israelites, those who are under the so-called Babylonian captivity of today, it's not for us to be worried about. I think, I would argue, that this is a sign that Babylon is about to fall as we see the American dollar crashing, as we see the shipments being stalled, as we see the cargo crates piling up in harbors all over the place. We're looking at 10 bucks a gallon for gasoline and or diesel in the not too distant future. We're seeing threats of food shortages. We've got droughts. They're talking about rolling blackouts across this country. And in the meantime, the political atmosphere is getting worse and worse and worse. In other words, the flashings and the thunderings and the earthquakes that we read about under the seventh vial. Folks, I am here to tell you right now not to be afraid because Babylon is about to fall. These days are not a time for Christians to despair. It is a time for Christians to look up. It is a time for Christians to rejoice. It is a time for Christians to hope because Babylon, folks, is about to get hers. Praise God Almighty. I would not be saying this if I wasn't 100% convinced. Now, is this going to happen tomorrow? Is it going to happen in the next 10 years? I don't know. Only God knows this, but what I can tell you with absolute certainty that it is not long. It is not long at all. And so don't be afraid. If you are in the fold of Christ, if you are under his wing, then you will have no reason to fear. Remember, even though the northern house of Israel was suffering from a drought in the days of Elijah, that widow still had enough for her and her son to eat. Elijah still had food to eat. And while the ten plagues were devastating Egypt, the Israelites were able to watch from a distance in the land of Goshen and say, wow, the power of God is amazing on our enemies. And then they walked out loaded with silver and gold. The vengeance of God for his people is massive. Let's go to, let's go to Jeremiah. In case, you're, in case you have any doubts as to why this judgment is coming, I encourage you to read through Isaiah and Jeremiah because there's a lot of talk about the judgment that is coming on Babylon. Jeremiah 50, verse 28. God says, There is a sound of fugitives and refugees from the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of Yahweh our God, vengeance for his temple. Folks, this judgment on Babylon is the exact same judgment that we read about in Revelation 17 and 18. The blood of the saints was within her. And if we understand that Babylon is human government from the time of Nimrod on up to the present day, human government that tries to elevate itself to the status of God, folks, let me tell you something, God is not going to put up with it. And we are about to see a day when that power falls. God is allowing them to have this much power and influence over the world so that they have plenty of rope to hang themselves with. This is a time of rejoicing for Christians, a time of hope. We can look forward to the future without being afraid. So folks, please don't be afraid. Don't despair. The time is coming when Christians will be able to lift their heads and say, our God is faithful, our God is powerful, and his kingdom is greater than any other kingdom, and I defy anyone to say otherwise. Praise God and amen. I could go on for another 30 minutes or so on this, but I'm, I'm going to cut myself short here. But if you have any thoughts to share with me, of course, as always, email me at tdi at mail.com. You can check out my website, tearingdownidols.com. And if you can, subscribe, like, share, do all that stuff with the podcast, with the video, wherever you find it on whatever platform. I appreciate it because it helps people get the message. And of course, as always, folks, until the next time, God bless, pray hard, and keep yourselves under Christ and above the world. This has been the Tearing Down Idols podcast, where we strike at the root of America's problems. 
subscribe, and visit tearingdownidols.com for more information. You can email the podcast at tdi at mail.com.